Hi everyone, uh, today I'm going to be talking about a piece of research software that I developed. Uh, it's called the Unity Experiment Framework and um, it's something I developed uh, during my PhD at Leeds and I developed this software to help uh, myself and others create uh, virtual reality experiments to investigate how uh, humans make decisions or any kind of human behavior. So I'll talk through um, kind of uh, why in general you might want to use virtual reality to to create these kind of experiments um, but also the technical details of how uh, UXF works and how you might apply this kind of uh, framework to, to your experiments. So my background is in um, investigating how humans make movements and how specifically we make errors. So one of the ways that we did this back in Leeds is to use a device like this. You can use it like a big joystick. It has other capabilities, but often we just use this for moving um, basically a circle on a screen towards other targets. So use this large device and you kind of, you know, you can design these little mini games that appear on the screen and participants have to learn how to control the shapes on the screen. Or alternatively, um, other people do uh, have setups like this where you have a tablet, a tablet computer and a screen in front and you can move like a air hockey puck around and see the shapes appear on, on the, the display. Um, so, as I was using this kind of technology, um, I kind of got frustrated with the clunky programming interfaces that they have. So, um, you know, these devices are specifically for, for research, so they don't have like huge, um, you know, resources online that you can find, you know, that will help you with solving every problem. Uh, they're not very well maintained. Some of them are, you know, decades old, that kind of thing. Um, and this is quite common with research software, you know, you're interfacing with these uh, niche devices that, that are quite old. And of course, that, that can make the software that you develop quite uh, kind of messy and hard to maintain. Um, and that leads to this, this lack of reproducibility. If you, you know, you program a, an experiment that's investigating how humans make decisions or something um, for a specific device, then people can't really just take that code and run it themselves. They're going to need the same device. Um, and another reason I, I wasn't so excited about doing this uh, with those those kind of experiments was that they don't have um, ecological validity. And uh, while I guess some people argue this isn't so important in um, in the experiments we do, but if you, if you imagine the, this kind of example here where you're moving a circle towards a target, um, we're trying to really investigate how humans how humans move and how we learn to make skillful movements. Really, what we're interested in is how people, you know, manage to throw a ball with great accuracy or manage to, like, balance while skiing at high speed down a hill. Um, we're not really interested in how we control circles on the screen. It's just kind of a proxy to what we are really interested in. So wouldn't it, it be great if we could actually test how humans throw balls and how, you know, that kind of thing, how, how humans move in the real world? These devices kind of, you know, have some limitations, you know, you might not be able to move these very fast or in a small amount of space. So you can imagine on this kind of device or this, you're not really going to be able to have them throw a ball at high speed or any any kind of fine movement or anything like that. Um, and as, as I've said, you know, you're only going to be able to get, I guess, these simple shapes. Uh, you can have, you know, more complex things, but it gets quite difficult because uh, you just a lot of the time you might be programming these in Python or uh, MATLAB where you don't have amazing gra graphics packages. So if we just think about if you're a behavioral scientist 
and you want to investigate how humans make decisions or how they move or whatever, what would be the you know, dream scenario? What would allow us to you know, have a um, kind of create the perfect experiment? What we'd really want to do is be able to you know, simulate an entire scenario, kind of like the matrix. You put someone in this scenario, put them in a social situation or some kind of um, situation where they're learning to perform a skilled movement or they're, you know, they have to remember some objects in a room. And it's done in such a way that it, you know, manipulates the, the sensors and everything looks realistic and three dimensional and feels like you're physically in this room. Everything reacts as it should in a way that tricks the brain into believing that it's really there. And that's going to be perfectly ecologically valid, right? Because the participant there is is really experiencing the scenario. It's not this fake kind of proxy scenario. And so um, if they were in the scenario and you can measure all their movements, all their responses, then that would give us a perfect experiment, right? So you might think this is, you know, far, very far away. It's basically impossible, but I think it's actually kind of within our grasp and modern technology can get you uh, quite far to, towards that goal. So what you'd need is something like virtual reality, these kind of headsets and a game engine like, like Unity. And so with these two things, you can create these high quality graphics scenarios. You can see like a screenshot of the Unity editor over here on the right, which allows you to kind of um, build up these, these 3D scenarios and you can put the headset on and you can really be inside the scenario. Um, and what's great is Unity and these headsets are really accessible. You know, th these headsets are very cheap compared to other research hardware. And of course, Unity is this hugely popular um, games engine. So there's, you know, so much support available and resources online. So you can make sure that you're, you know, creating really good software. Um, and another point I made that I, I disliked about, uh, you know, using the specialist hardware for, for experiments is that it doesn't allow reproducibility because other people might not have the same hardware. Because here you create this experiment that's defined entirely in just kind of a, you know, it's all a piece of code, really. You can send that piece of code to someone else. And as long as they have a, a headset, it doesn't even have to be the same kind of headset. They'll be able to reproduce that really easily. And because these are cheap, you know, you can expect that people can get their hands on them and reproduce these experiments. So it's really good for being uh, for allowing reproducible experiments, and of course, the ecological validity can be much increased when you are using this kind of headset because, as I talked about, you know you can move around, um, and you can have this perfect scenario that really tricks the brain into believing that you're in this other place. You can even use your hands to interact with the scenario in a realistic way. And if you put these headsets on, you really can feel like you're convinced and you can even get, you know, um, feel a vertigo if you you know, look over uh, a steep edge or something like that. Um, if you're not convinced, here's some videos that I like to show. You might have seen this kind of thing already, but these people clearly, <laughs> truly believe they are in these scenarios. <laughs> Watch it. What is he doing right now? What the hell? He's stretching out. He's coming by he's me now. Oh, Whoa, he's standing up. He's gonna. He's biting the tree. Oh, oh my god. Watch out. What?
is hopefully that gives you an idea, you know, convinces you that people who, when you wear these headsets, you really are going to feel like you're inside this other other world, and therefore your the actions that you make are going to be much more realistic compared to, you know, if you were just looking at shapes on the screen. So how do we utilize this technology for our research? So obviously these VR headsets and uh, the Unity software is uh, mostly you know, targeted at commercial games. So it's something we have to bear in mind when we utilize this for, for research. Um, the Unity engine allows us to write our code in, in C Sharp and we have to write all this experiment code. We have to uh, you know, define the structure of the experiment, which trials appear in what order, what are the uh, kind of variables that um, affect each trial, what data are we collecting. Then we have to write out the data for those, um, for those scenarios and uh, you know, create all the folders and organize all the data files. So that's um, something that um, you have to do, and I guess Unity doesn't have any kind of assistance for this kind of thing because it's these are mostly um, you know research focused um, kind of requirements. So I kind of wanted to build something that allows users to uh, get some assistance in in doing this kind of thing. So I'll just show you the kind of experiment that I'm thinking of when I think of using VR um, for, for behavior research. So this is a really simple experiment where uh, the participant here is just swiping and selecting one of two targets. And we're investigating how their feedback um, affects their subsequent decisions. So you can see this is like a really simple experiment, um, but she she's using a real arm movement here and um, you know you could argue that's much more realistic than using you know, things on a screen and here the feedback is in 3d so you know it's much more convincing and there's all the uh, reproducibility advantages that i talked about so as i set out to develop this framework um, i wanted to provide those those features that i talked about uh, that help you build the experiment but I also wanted it to be a general so it's not going to be specific to you know movement experiments or memory experiments or anything like that it's just got to be general anybody can use it for any kind of um, behavior experiment and I wanted it to help make people's code more readable and maintainable um, and another point is that I didn't aim to create any kind of stimulus presentation. So that's, you know, the actual rendering of the 3D models or anything like that, because Unity already has all these rich features to allow you to do that. So I didn't kind of want to get in the way in this case. I've just kind of given you the nuts and bolts in the background to help you build the scenarios. Um, and of course, um, I made the framework to be interacted with through code so while that means there's still some barrier to entry it's not going to be you know you can make an experiment without code uh, it means you've got lots more flexibility in terms of you know how you structure your experiment and things like that as, as we'll talk about so if we just take a step back if you're not familiar with um, kind of cognitive science experiments that kind of thing the way that we set them up is that you're going to have some um, independent variables that you can manipulate that could be something in the world or it could be um, uh, well we'll get into the examples but how these independent variables affect dependent variables so dependent variables are the ones that we can measure so in this example here the participant has two targets and we want to measure which target the participant selects and maybe how fast those are just some examples we might want to manipulate in terms of our independent variables the size of these targets the distance um, the number of stars in each one that's the reward so um, we'll go through how uxf here can help um, 
kind of encode those into the experiment um, so that we can you know build build these in so um, UXF has this kind of structure which goes in this kind of loop here so it kind of uh, repeats a bunch of trials a trial um, is just a single kind of instance of a scenario and typically in an experiment you're going to repeat these multiple times uh, and these are grouped within blocks which all kind of share something in common and then the whole a whole run of an experiment is called a session so here within the session there's this kind of uh, structure here that is built into UXF already so as a user here you don't have to actually um, create this kind of structure it's already built you just have to hook into the structure at the certain points that you're interested in so for example when the trial begins you might want to make these targets appear in front of the player so to do that you can just write the piece of code that makes those targets appear and then using some kind of unity um, if you're not familiar with unity it's not so important here but you can have these events here that you can assign such that this function here runs when this event is invoked. So when the trial begins, it's going to invoke this piece of code here, which is shown here. So makes it really easy. You can just kind of create these little custom Unity functions, and then UXF can um, kind of run these at the at the right time. And if you look at some typical experiment code, some people uh, might write code like this uh, that uh, defines an experiment. So you've got trial one, two, three, four, five, and for each trial, you might want to make something different happen. Um, obviously, this you can see how this can get really messy. You've got this repetition. We don't really know uh, why, you know, the the certain values at certain times. And of course, you've got to write this, and you've got to go back. Probably, if you're writing a methods section of a paper, you've got to go back and write all this up in the methods section. So it's going to be quite messy here. So UXF uh, can help you here make this much more uh, readable and much more maintainable. So with UXF, there's this important concept of separating the specification of the experiment and the implementation of the experiment. So in these two sections, uh, I, f I found it really useful to separate these and makes the code um, much easier to develop. So first we have to specify the variables in our experiment. So in this case, we're specifying a target distance and a target diameter, and we're specifying for each trial they're going to have a combination of, of these two here. So it's not so important, the, the exact implementation. But basically, all you need to know is that this happens once at the start of the experiment. So you predefine all of your trials. So you kind of pre-build this list of trials and say that this one has this diameter and this distance. This one has this diameter and this distance. And you predefine all those. And then actually, when you actually go to present that and make it appear in the world, you just have to take that setting. So we're taking the distance and the diameter that is assigned to that trial and taking that and using it um, kind of in a, you know, in Unity's, for using Unity's functions to make this appear in front of them. Um, and so this, this separation makes it important. It is important because this is really important for the scientific part of the um, the software, as in this will be interesting to readers of your research article. This, not so much, because this is just how it's actually implemented in Unity, which is just a technical detail, it's an implementation. So this here is separated from this, and this, you know, I, I really like how, how this can be done with UXF and um, yeah, I think if people use this, they'll find it's really useful. And it also allows more complex definitions of the experiment. So you could have 
uh, something like the first block of trials has a lower difficulty or just 10% of trials are, have something different about them or you might want to randomize the order of the trials. Uh, this is going to be quite difficult if you have something like this here. Um, and it, it can look quite messy, but you can really easily encode these rules uh, in in the experiment specification uh, with something like this. So you can just say, you know, create, create, create a block of practice uh, trials, 10 trials here, and I'm going to set the value of difficulty to 75%. And um, here I might want to set the second trial in the main block, um, the value of target size to 10. Um, I could also shuffle, shuffle the block so that the trials appear in a random order. So this allows you to really easily kind of uh, create the structure of the experiment that you, that you need. So that's for the independent variables, the variables we have control over, but there's also the dependent variables. These are the ones that we can only measure. So there's, in, in UXF, there's three different levels of data. One is just per participant. So that means for each participant, there's a single data point for each variable. So they have an age, a gender, that kind of thing. It could also be per trial. So you know, if they're doing a series of decisions, we just want to know what was the choice that they made in each of those decisions. Um, and then we could also have per time step data. So that is, for example, the reaching motion. So each time point as, the, as they are actually reaching for a target, we want to know the position of the hand. And we can obviously use that to recreate the trajectories of, of movement. And UXF does this without the user having to make any folders or worry about naming files and things like that. It does all that kind of stuff automatically. So this is how UXF handles the participant uh, data collection. When the researcher launches the application, um, they can, or the part, they or the participant can enter this information here. Um, and these can be customized, so you can add, you know, any kind of um, any kind of data point with any kind of uh, data type here. You can have them enter text or drop down that kind of thing. Um, and this makes it really easy. You know, the the researcher doesn't have to build their own user interface. They can just uh, specify the data points, and they'll automatically appear here. The per trial data is. Uh, captured via code. So if I want to record which target the user selected, um, I just have to write something like this. This is a real line of code. So I just say the current trial result um, and I'm getting the, the, the chosen target variable and I'm assigning it to the name of the target that they chose, for example. Um, and if I do this, I'm going to automatically get a CSV file that looks like this. So the user doesn't have to do anything. Uh, this just comes out like this. And this is, you know, really easy how you just have to write this and you get this uh, CSV output. And then for the third level where you have the movement trajectories, um, you just have to use this Unity script that I wrote and you can assign this to any object in the unity scene so that could be the user's hands or the user's head or even like a virtual object like a ball that they throw and if you assign this um, to the object you can get a CSV output on each trial that tells you the position and rotation of the object over time. Um, so that's it for the data collection features. So as I talked about, it also has this, this user interface. Another thing um, it can do aside from this data collection here is the um, experiment settings profile. So what this does is allows the researcher to create a series of these .json files, which define within them um, a series of settings that can be applied for that session. So you could have, you know, a couple of different 
settings profiles here that the, that the researcher can select from at the start. So it could be, you know, you have two different conditions. You might have, um, you know, often in experiments you're doing, what does this condition, how does this condition compare to another condition? So you can create those two set settings profiles and then just select the one you want uh, to, to run. And then of course, within your code, you can access these settings that are stored inside here and use them to manipulate the scene. Um, so as I said, with the stimulus presentation, in terms of the rendering of the 3D models, UXF has no uh, features there. You can use anything from Unity. You know, Unity has these amazing graphics and animation tools, even like real-time physics tools. So uh, that's kind of, I see that as an advantage. You know, you don't have to, um, I don't have to uh, uh, use a preset selection of models or uh, images or anything like that. It's anything you can Unity can do, you can do here. So this is an example of another experiment I built, which is called an interceptive timing task. So as these blocks fall down, the user has to use this little circle cursor to intercept them. So you can see here, this is kind of um, done in a stylistic gamified way. And this is done because this experiment was targeted towards children and young, young adults. So we wanted to make the experiment kind of fun and accessible. And it's, I think, much more um, engaging than just having a couple of circles on a screen. Um, so, you know, that's one of the advantages I see of using Unity and, and UXF. You can just have all these amazing graphics features. Uh, I'll just show another one here as well. So this is a, a reaching task where the user has to decide how to approach a target. So in this case, there's all these obstacles. The user has to collect this target behind here. They have to decide, do they move these objects out of the way or do they just go around? So this really shows when the advantages advantages of VR, you wouldn't be able to do this really in 2D. You wouldn't be able to do this very easily in the real world just because of the logistical challenges of arranging all these kind of things. Um, so this is obviously using the kind of Unity physics engine a little to make these objects move somewhat realistically. Um, and just a kind of small note on this, um, there is some support for experiments in the cloud. So what that means is you can have your experiments deployed remotely. So, you know, I could create an experiment and somebody across the world could download the software, put on their headset that they have at home or, you know, somewhere else in another lab or something. And then the data from that experiment is uploaded to a server somewhere that I as a researcher can access. Um, obviously this, you know, is, can be really useful, but it's, it's quite complicated to set up. So there is some, um, support for this, um, if you look online, um, but it's, you know, it's not, it's not perfect, but it can be done. And you can get UXF by just going to this link. There's this GitHub page where we have. Uh, all of the code and a package that you can download to import into your Unity project. And of course, there's a wiki on here where it has all of the uh, documentation and detail that you need for debugging and, and uh, getting UXF in integrated into your project. We also wrote a paper last year which goes over this in more detail. If you're interested in reading, this is um, last year in Behavior Research Methods. Uh, this is an article about UXF and kind of the the uh, technical details as well as some of the more broader things that I've talked about today. Um, so finally then, um, UXF, I built this to, uh, you know, alleviate some of the some of the problems I saw with, uh, you know, creating ex experiments, it's supposed to help make your code uh, kind of tidy and have this, this separation of spe specification implementation as like I, I talked about. 
uh, helps make your your code much more reproducible reproducible and portable because you're just creating an experiment in software that you just need a, a cheap vr headset to use uh, you know uxf is going to handle all of this uh, boring part of the development for you and um, you're just left to create the fun part which is you know making the graphics and making all of the you know cool um, things appear in the 3d world and I think this kind of um, you know 3d approach and virtual reality approach to to have it to kind of um, uh, psychology experiments is revolutionary for how we how we are going to do things in the future, specifically for you know movement and decision-making tasks, where it's really important to have these realistic movements and be able to capture those, but also to be able to you know um, make those experiments reproducible and maintainable in the future as we you know move towards making sure all our code is is shareable and reproducible. So I'd just like to thank my colleagues from Leeds who helped um, assist with, with creating of this this framework, Vessel, Mark and Matthew. Those guys are over at the Immersive Cognition Group in Leeds. You know, they're doing some great work with, with VR um, as well as some other research in cognitive science. Um, thanks for listening, everyone.